The Prosecutors is brought to you by Progressive. Progressive helps you compare direct auto rates from a variety of companies so you can find a great one, even if it's not with them. Quote today at Progressive.com to find a rate that works with your budget. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. I just casually looked towards the canal and uh, I saw what I thought was a mannequin. August 2nd, 1998, the body of a brilliant young scientist is found dead near the campus of Georgetown University. It was a gruesome scene. Walking up to the body, um, it became apparent that there had been a sexual assault. For more than six years, DC police had no leads and no suspects. Then another disturbing discovery. She wasn't his only victim. As these cases went on, the more the victims resisted, the more violent he became. One man committing a series of heinous crimes against women, but then he just stops. 10 years go by, then 20. What would it take to finally crack the case wide open? I'm Paul Wagner. Join me for Unknown Subject, season three of WTOP's American Nightmare podcast series, available October 4th on all podcast platforms. I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the prosecutors. Today on The Prosecutors, over a 10 week period, an unknown perpetrator prowled Texarkana at night, attacking eight people and murdering five. Who was the phantom killer? The man who haunted the town, the dreaded Sundown. Everybody and welcome to this episode of The Prosecutors. I'm Brett, and I'm joined, as always, by my Simpa co-host, Alice. Simpa. Yes, that's I from have... Audrey. Oh, I have no apparently, idea. What that means. Apparently, it's French slang for cool. Oh, so. I mean, it's Simpa cool. Simpa cool. There I love it. Thank you. And you I love the French language. I don't know it. The romance languages are all beautiful. I learned Spanish, of course, because so I lived romantic. in Texas. It's yeah. not. I mean, well, I mean, the way I speak it is not romantic. Spanish itself is romantic. The way I speak it is jarring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same. I took three years of Spanish in high school and can't speak any of it. So what are you well, going to do? Well, can we just talk about the elephant in the room? This of course. is October is my most scaredy cat month of the year. I just want to crawl under like a blanket and watch Hallmark Christmas movies and not think about all the scary things that come up in October. So you always force me to do these like really creepy stories and I do them because I love you, but they really creep me out. So there we go. There's the elephant in the room that I'm doing this against my will. It's true. Every year I make you do a whole month of these. Oh, crazy this is the this is our third october isn't that hard to believe it actually is it makes me feel really old because like I, know. I just i just feel old where is the time i can't gone? believe how old the podcast is this is like our 150th episode or something we should have a birthday party for the podcast as i sit here trying well, to birthday's not till may so <laughs> i know but it's like baby's first christmas podcasts for mm. third halloween, third halloween. <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah well, I do love Halloween. I love October. I love everything about Halloween. And this year, we are doing true crime that inspired horror movies. So, as I always tell people, those of you who don't like October, for reasons that are unclear to me and don't like our October episodes, they're just like the regular episodes, except with a little twist on them. Look, I'm not saying I don't like our episodes. I'm just saying they're extra creepy to me, and the aura of it being October just makes like the hair on my neck rise up but guys these are all true crime stories exactly these are all true crime stories and all of you should enjoy them and this is a classic true crime story one that not only inspired a horror movie but arguably inspired an entire genre of horror movies we are talking about the phantom killer 
of Texarkana, who inspired the movie, The Town That Dreaded Sundown. And because we are talking about movies, I will be watching this movie. When you guys are listening to this, tonight, I will be watching this movie. I'll probably start around 8 or so. Check me out on Twitter if you want to watch it with me. We will live tweet it, and you guys can let me know what you think. So that's what we're going to do. Watching a movie with Brett, by the way, is like a treat. So y'all should take him up on this. I'm not going to take him up on it, but y'all should. <laughs> I'm excited. I have seen this movie before, but I'm going to watch it again just for you guys. So join me tonight on Twitter, 8 o'clock Central Time, thereabouts. We'll get started. But that's enough introduction, I think. Alice, let's dive into this story. Let's talk about this story. Let's just get it over with. I'm kidding. Let's not actually get it over with, but already just your tagline, Brett, for this episode has me creepy crawly because this is a historical, kind of historical. It's been a long time, but Texarkana, Arkansas in 1946 was much like much of the rural parts of America. It was the kind of place where not locking your doors and trusting your neighbors was more than just a cliche. Still, bathing in the afterglow of the end of World War II, the young people of Texarkana probably felt like they were standing on the edge of modernity, ready to leave the past behind and launch into a bright new future. And modernity was coming to Texarkana. Soon, people would be locking their doors, they wouldn't trust their neighbors, and for some, their future would be snuffed out by an entity that America would soon become all too familiar with, the serial killer. This is the story of the Phantom Killer and the town that dreaded sun down. Great name for a movie, by the way. I just love it. I mean... It is. It's just, yeah. It's surprising this movie's not more famous because such a great title. And for those of you who've seen the amazing artwork that Hannah did for this episode, that is a take on the famous movie poster from the town that dreaded sundown, which is sort of an accurate description of what this person looked like. They were often described as having this hood over their head with holes cut out for the eyes. And this was the inspiration for those of you who like Friday the 13th for Jason Voorhees and his first appearance, which was more or less in Friday the 13th part two. He wasn't actually the killer in part one. And in that movie, they use this as inspiration. So Jason in that movie did not have a hockey mask, which is what he is most associated with. He had the same sack over his head with, with cutouts for the eyes, which was inspired by this movie. And in fact, by this real life serial killer. That's enough movie trivia. So this goes all the way back, like Alice said, to 1946. And we're going to start with February 22nd, 1946. Jimmy Hollis, who was 25 years old, and his girlfriend, Mary Jean Larry, who was 19, go out on a Friday night to see a movie. Probably a Friday night like many and nothing spectacular about this at all. At around 11.45 p.m., the movie has ended. And Jimmy and Mary Jean drive to a local lover's lane, a secluded area where they can have a little alone time. They needed to have this secluded area because both were married at the time. They were in the process of getting a divorce. Both of them were. But they couldn't just go to each other's homes. They'd been there for about 10 minutes when a man approached their vehicle on the driver's side and shone a flashlight through the window. The light may have prevented Jimmy from seeing the person because he immediately said that the man had the wrong guy. It's possible he thought this was a cop. Obviously, cops will often interrupt people who are parked on lover's lanes and get them to move along, and it wouldn't be the first time that a cop simply shined a light into the vehicle to get the person's attention. Now, had Jimmy been able to see the man, it's unlikely that he would have said anything so blasé. He was wearing a hood over his head with two holes cut out so that he could see. The man told Jimmy, I don't want to kill you, fellow, so do what I say. Now, when Jimmy got out of the car, he was made to take off his pants. At this point, the man struck him in the head twice with a pistol with such force that his skull was actually fractured. The sound of his skull fracturing was so loud 
that his girlfriend, Mary Jean, thought he'd been shot. Mary Jean's now terrified. She's trying to placate this, this man by showing them they don't have any money. She doesn't have anything to offer him. But if he was there to rob them, he didn't act like it. Instead, he told her to run. Mary Jean did, and she came upon a car on the side of the road. She sought help from that vehicle, but unfortunately, it was abandoned. She was about to start running again when, like a killer from a horror movie, the man in the hood appeared in front of her, asking why she had run. She responded, because you told me to. At this point, he called her a liar and punched her in the face, knocking her to the ground. He took his gun and sexually assaulted her with the barrel, and there's no telling what else he might have done had headlights not appeared in the distance. At this point, the man with the hood fled into the woods and was gone. Oh, gosh. <sighs> like, how does that not just give you such incredible creeps? It really... I mean, they're alive. They're telling this story, but the whole run and then to just appear out of nowhere. And the whole point of picking Lover's Lane is there's not a lot of traffic. So it's not like she has anywhere to run to or to yell and have someone, you know, find her because the whole point of this place is it's secluded. Yeah. And it's one of those things where in a movie, that sort of thing happens to scare the audience. But I think this guy fully intended to kill her. So this is all about, he, he's not expecting her to tell this story, right? You know, there are times when people will do things to other people because they want them to tell the story. They want there to be a survivor to sort of tell the tale of what happened. But here, I think he fully intends to kill her. I think he probably thought that Jimmy was dead. Now he's going to kill her. And so this is all for the purpose of torturing her for sort of, imposing his will on her for psychological terror and horror. I mean, that's what he's doing. And that just, I mean, it should give you the creeps because there are different kinds of people. There are different kinds of criminals. I mean, criminals, you can't lump all criminals together. You can't lump all murderers together. There are certain people who, for whatever reason, take great joy in torturing other people. They take great joy in the fear of other people. And these are typically the most depraved people of all. And so at the time, I don't think the police or Mary Jean or Jimmy knew what they were dealing with. But I think now, if this happened today and the FBI found out about it, they would immediately warn the police, you got a really dangerous person on your hand because this is not an ordinary criminal. This is somebody who's doing this for something beyond robbery beyond even you know sexual gratification or anything like that i mean this is somebody who really is a threat to escalate their crimes and as we will see he did but they were very fortunate these lights come over the hill as if in a movie and she's rescued and so is jimmy so jimmy hollis is taken to the hospital to recover from his fractured skull which he will eventually do the police initially followed the most obvious theory which is, this is Mary Jean's husband. They're in the process of getting a divorce. He probably knows about Jimmy and he's probably shown up to torture them for those reasons. He's out for revenge. But when they picked him up, he had a solid alibi. And so the police turned to the two victims to try and get some idea about who this was. Now, both of them agreed that the man was around six feet tall and in his late twenties or early 30s. Jimmy thought he was a tanned white man, whereas Mary Jean claimed she thought he was a light-skinned black man. They both sort of got sort of a general impression. I mean, you got to remember, it's dark outside. Jimmy's been blinded by a flashlight. Didn't have much opportunity to see this guy before he gets hit in the back of the head. Mary Jean, I mean, he's wearing this hood, so she's kind of guessing too. You have these two people who are giving them sort of opposite views. Now, the police were concerned about racial tensions in Texarkana. They had been simmering in the town, which was not uncommon for this time. And so they really didn't want to spur that on without, without more evidence on what they're getting from Mary Jean. So they essentially ignore what she's saying. And in fact, they were pretty skeptical of both of them. And it's a little unclear now looking at the historical record why this is true. But one thing we can say is the police thought 
that the two knew their attacker and were protecting him for some reason. Now, they both were absolutely adamant that they didn't know who this was. And obviously, if they did, they would tell the police. And given what he did to them, I would think that's probably true. But for whatever reason, the police didn't believe them. And they decided this was just some weird thing, some sort of personal vendetta. And they kind of dropped it. They didn't really look any further into that. Just expecting this is an isolated incident and we're not going to hear anything more about it. Yeah, that's super bizarre, Brett, because even if it were a personal vendetta, there's been a sexual assault and a skull fractured by some person. So even if it were an isolated incident, it's a very violent incident. Now, on March 24th, so about a month later, the police's lackadaisical approach to the Hollis Larry attack would prove fatal. On Sunday morning, March 24th, a father and son heading to church came upon a parked car on a known lover's lane just south of Texarkana in Texas. They saw blood and bodies and immediately called the police. When they arrived on the scene, they found Richard Griffin, who was 29, and Polly Ann Moore, who was 17, dead in the vehicle. Griffin was on his knees behind the front seat his pants down and his head resting on his hands. Moore was next to him, face down on the back seat. Both had been shot, execution style, twice in the back of the head. The large amount of blood outside indicated the killer had killed them there and then put the bodies in the car. And just one thing to note, Texarkana is called that for a reason. So Texarkana is actually divided in half. And half of the city is in Texas and half of the city is in Arkansas. So it's sort of an interesting place, unique place. I'm sure there's a lot of weird jurisdictional issues there that would probably be a pretty interesting legal briefs episode. <laughs> I don't know how to handle some of this stuff. But in this case, they find them on the Texas side of Texarkana. So, you know, that's just sort of a... An interesting little quirk of this story. And just notice, the, the positioning of the bodies is very interesting, but what we do know is that they didn't die in those positions. They were moved there, including the fact that Griffin was on his knees with pants down. Remember what happened back in February to Jimmy? He was told to take his pants off as well. Now, this is a very gruesome scene that this father and son come across. And the police show up and they realize that they have something really serious on their hands. So they call in the Texas Rangers. So the local jurisdiction is like, this is bigger than us. We need help and enter the Texas Rangers. And when Ranger Jimmy Greer arrived on the scene, he was disheartened to realize that the scene had been irrevocably compromised. Evidence was handled with officers bare hands and spectators picked through the scene, discovering some of the evidence on their own. Remember what we've talked about? If you come across a crime scene, do not enter it. It is impossible to not take something and not leave something behind and to contaminate the scene. And so it sounds like it was kind of local folks who hadn't really dealt with this level of a crime scene before and they did not properly secure the scene. And so people were allowed to kind of just dig through it and it's just been compromised. So based on the bullets pulled from the bodies, the Rangers were able to identify the weapon as a Colt 32 automatic pistol. But if the Rangers were hoping for answers, they didn't get much further than that. But there would be unfortunately another opportunity yeah and it's interesting so your first attack is february 22nd now it's a month later it's march 24th and you're having the second attack both attacks are situations where you have people lovers quote unquote who are parked on a lover's lane and whoever this is is coming upon them and it is interesting. We already have an elevation here. And the first one, whoever it was, used his firearm to hit somebody in the head. He hit him pretty hard. He cracked their skull, but he didn't kill him. And you got to think he knew that. Once it was over, even if he thought he killed him at the time, once it was over, he probably read in the papers or heard it through the grapevine. Not a huge town, Texarkana. Probably learned about it. And so he would have known. So is he escalating just because he's escalating? And that's what these kind of people tend to do. Or is he realized, I don't need to leave survivors behind. And so he decides to kill these people. Or 
Was it just that he was interrupted the first time? And if he hadn't been interrupted, he was going to kill both of them. He might have gone back and killed Jimmy or made sure Jimmy was dead. Obviously, he's not just killing them and leaving them. He's spending some time with the body. He's arranging the bodies in a way that's significant to him. Unclear why he's doing it this way, why he's pulling the pants down, why he's putting them in the back of the car. Hard to say exactly what he's doing, but this is part of the thing that motivates him. It's part of his MO and he has elevated this way. And we're going to see again, this time, sometime later, but not quite as much time, April 13th, 1946. So Betty Jo Booker played saxophone at the local VFW on Saturday nights, but this time she didn't come home. The next morning, this is another Saturday night. So the next morning, a couple out for an early drive saw the body of a young man on the side of the road. They called the police who found Paul Martin, a 17 year old boy lying on his side. He'd been shot four times in the right hand, shoulder, back of the neck and in the face. Despite these wounds, police theorized he'd actually been shot on the other side of the road as the blood trail indicated he'd crossed the street before finally dying of his injuries. It wasn't long before the police learned that Paul Martin had last been seen with Betty Jo Booker, whose mother had reported her missing earlier that day. Now, they didn't initially see Betty Jo, so they didn't initially know if she was still there or not, but they decided to assemble a search party and they would find Betty Jo's body just shy of two miles from where Martin lay dead. Whoever had killed her had staged the body so that her coat was fully buttoned and her hand was tucked inside her pocket. Were it not for the bullet through her heart and face, she might have been sleeping. Later testing by the FBI would indicate that she had been raped. The weapon used to kill the two was the same 32 caliber pistol as used in the other murders. The papers dubbed the murderer the Phantom Killer. Betty Jo's saxophone, for what it's worth, and we'll come back to this, was missing. Now, what I find interesting about this, Betty Jo is two miles from where Martin lay dead. And just to go back to this sort of horror movie theme that we've been talking about, I don't think this person marched Betty Jo two miles into the woods. I think this was part of his game. I think she ran. Maybe he told her to run. Maybe she ran on her own. One reason I think that is because Martin wasn't killed where he was found. You know, he crawled across the street, which kind of indicates maybe the guy shot him four times, but didn't have a chance to finish him off because Betty Joe takes off. It's also possible he shot him four times and just figured he'd die either way. But I think this is part of it. I think this is like the first one. I think he told her to run or he let her run. And then he kind of hunted her through these woods. I think that was part of the thrill for him to chase her through the woods. He knew she wasn't going to get away. He knew there was nowhere she should go. And then, you know, two miles later, he finally corrals her and does what he does and murders her. And, and this guy, I mean, this guy's, this is a creepy guy. This is a guy that's got a lot of a lot of deep seated issues and we don't talk about serial killers a lot on this podcast, but in a lot of ways, this guy is kind of a template for what you're going to see going forward in the 1940s. This is very early to have this kind of serial killer. You just didn't see people like this. I mean, there had been serial killers before, obviously a lot of them are famous, but when you think of sort of the age of serial killers, you think of the 60s and the 70s. And a lot of those guys, I don't know that they modeled themselves after this person or if this person was just one of the first examples of whatever it was that drove those sort of modern serial killers. Because his MO and the way he's acting and the way he gets joy, not just from the killing, but from the process of inflicting pain and terror and fear is very modern and very sort of ahead of its time in a way. Yeah, Brett, you know, the thing that stuck out in the first story in February was when he told her to run and that he shows up and asks her a ridiculous question. Why did you run? That is something incredibly sadistic. We see this now in modern times and we see copycats of people who've watched a lot of movies where this happens, where there's the hunter going after their prey. And we've we kind of seen the copycat 
after these movies have come out like this. But back in 1946, this was, I mean, of course there were murders. Of course, you know, there were terrible things that happened back in the 40s. But this type of joy from being able to torture someone and inflict immense amounts of fear in them as you are killing them and raping them in this case is not something that you see across murders. That's pretty rare. And especially because we know what happened with Mary Jean who got away in the February instance, we have an idea what happened now. If we didn't have her story and Jimmy's story, we may not exactly understand what happened here. But I think you're right. Those two miles, I think she ran on her own feet. And I don't think he may have even driven after her or he may have walked slowly after her, hearing her footsteps and her cries probably as she's panting and getting more tired and eventually probably giving up at some point. And he doesn't have to run after her. There's nowhere for her to go there. He knows, you know, the nearest home. She's not going to get there on foot. And so it's almost like he just waits his time like, you know, like a stalking tiger who can conserve their energy until it's time to strike. And, and let me say this. I think a lot of this points towards a killer who's from the town. So we're going to talk about suspects in a minute. And it is possible this is a transient. This is somebody who's in town for a little while, commits some murders and then leaves. And that would be consistent with the fact that the murders do end. But I think the confidence this person had that they could let someone leave the scene. And we're speculating about this, but you're not speculating about the first one. The first one, we know for a fact that he told her to run and that he was able to get in front of her and be there essentially when she arrived and she had no idea that he was following her, that he'd circled around, however he did it. And that tells me this is somebody who's very familiar with this terrain. He's very comfortable with it. I think he was comfortable with this forest. I think he knew she could run through this forest and he could find her. And there was no way she was going to get out without him finding her, whether it was because she would end up circling around towards him or there was nowhere really to go, or he would just find her eventually. I think he felt very confident in this as his hunting ground. And that indicates that this is somebody who knew it well. This is probably somebody who's from the area. That's consistent with most studies of people who are serial killers. It is very rare to have the serial killer, and they exist, but it is very rare to have a serial killer who does not hunt in his own area. So at this point, things are escalating, and the police have decided to escalate their efforts. On April 16th, famed Texas Ranger Manuel Trezazas, Lone Wolf Gonzalez, arrives on the scene. In his 26 years as a Texas Ranger, he had killed 75 outlaws, all justified, of course, which it is hard to imagine in today's environment. So many people. I mean, that's a lot of people. It's hard to, I, even, I don't know how you Even can... like in combat, I think that's a lot of people. I mean, this is like out of, once again, this is like out of a movie, right? I mean, so, I so, you think... know, Texas Rangers are the original, I, I might, someone, someone's going to write to me and yell at me, but you know, the first FBI agents were Texas Rangers. And part of it was because it's, it's in a beautiful book, Killers of the Flower Moon, detailing kind of the birth of the FBI. But when basically they can't solve a crime, they reach out to these like, very fine line between law enforcement and outlaws themselves, Texas Rangers, who quite literally just live on the range and live and die by the like rough justice out there. They just carry guns and they're on horseback and they deal out justice and they are tough and they are rough. But this is exactly what a Texas Ranger did back in the day, <laughs> hunt down outlaws and just kill them. Well, yeah, and it's kind of like Bonnie and Clyde, right? I mean, Bonnie and Clyde were on this spree of killing and robbing and everything else, and nobody could handle them. So what they do? They told the Texas Rangers, go take care of it. And they didn't arrest them. They shot them. <laughs> they, you know, they basically ambushed them and just made sure that they wouldn't make it out. So I'm not going to be too critical of old Long Wolf, though it's hard to imagine that you could actually kill 75 people and they all be justified. The television show Justified, I don't know that Raylan Givens killed 75 people across six seasons of Justified or whatever, but this guy managed to pull it off. In any event, they bring him in and he's going to solve it. At one point, he says he's not leaving town until he solves it. Somebody tells him he might want to buy a house then. But he's, he's going to solve it. Now, the fact that he was famous and he's coming in and tell everybody he's going to take care of it did little to calm the fears of the town. At this point, 
with three different attacks, four people dead, two people seriously injured, and this guy's still on the run. People are preparing to take matters into their own hands. Everywhere that sold guns was sold out. Houses that had never had locks now had a bunch of them, and people were barring their doors. Teenagers would now park in lovers' lanes, heavily armed, in the hopes that the killer would show up and they could take out the Phantom. More than one police officer found himself staring down the barrel of a gun and almost shot when he knocked on the door of a parked car. But it was then that things got even weirder. So... On May 3rd, 1946, it was almost time to go to sleep when Katie Starks lay down in the bed she shared with her husband, Virgil. Virgil was sitting in the living room reading when Katie heard a commotion she couldn't place. She crawled out of bed and walked into the living room. There was Virgil, but he was slumped over in a growing pool of blood, two bullets in the back of his head. It would turn out he'd been shot with a 22 caliber rifle from outside the home. Katie turned to run to the telephone, but two shots rang out. One struck her in the face and the other smashed into her jaw, lodging below her tongue. She fell to the floor, but amazingly she wasn't dead. She could hear her attacker ramming himself into the back door. So she gathered what strength she had and ran out the front door to a neighbor's house. When the police arrived, they found that the killer had indeed made it inside. He'd covered the walls in handprints, handprints made from Virgil's blood. The police were able to find some footprints, a fingerprint, and a red flashlight the killer had dropped. So this murder, almost double murder, is a little bit different. This is in their own home. They weren't on any lover's lane. They were just at home getting ready for bed and shot from the outside. Now, panic really took a hold, and the story went national. It wasn't long before Life magazine was on the scene, and the whole world learned about this killer, who seemed to strike like clockwork every three weeks. Neighbor turned on neighbor, and tips flowed into the police. But then something strange happened. The attacks just stopped. And nobody knew why. And, you know, it's funny. In so many of these cases, it's like this. These things, they seem to begin for no apparent reason, and then they seem to end for no apparent reason. And the question, maybe it would help solve the case if you could figure out why. And you go all the way back to Jack the Ripper. Jack the Ripper, who's probably the first serial killer that we really think about. And his murders started, and then as abruptly as they started, they ended. And some people think that the reason his murders ended when they did was that the last one was the one where he was able to sort of fully experience whatever it was he wanted to experience. His last murder, it wasn't on the street. It was in a room, and it's by far the bloodiest and the most gruesome. And some people think the same thing here, that this was the time when the killer was really able to get out whatever he was getting out. He was in the room. He's like got the blood all over him, just all this crazy stuff, the handprints on the walls, just all this stuff. And then maybe that was the reason. Or maybe he was arrested. Maybe he died. I mean, that's a pretty common thing when you see these things stop. Look for people who were arrested. You know, if you're looking at a serial killer who seems to take a pause and then restart, one way to try and figure out who it is is figure out who all went to jail or went to prison right when it stopped and if any of them happened to get out right when it started again. And so this is a question that for the last 80 years now, people have wondered about. Why did he begin when he did and why did he end when he did? And it's not just that. It's confusing. As Alice mentioned, this last killing is different. It's a dramatic shift in both the MO, the weapons used, and the targets. It's not a handgun. It's not a lover's lane. It's not young people. It's a married couple. It's a strike in the home from outside the home initially. And this is a very different thing. Now, it's possible and some people have speculated that these are unrelated attacks. Some people, some of the authorities even think that. But if that's the case, it is a pretty remarkable murder at a pretty remarkable 
time. The police were never able to identify any enemies that the couple had. They dug into these people, looking for affairs, looking for grudges, looking for money owed, anything that might spur this kind of attack, and they couldn't find anything. So if you think this is separate, you have to think there are two murderers who are doing these kind of dramatic killings at the same time. Now, it's definitely true that Texarkana was growing and crime was growing with it, but this is not the kind of attack you would just see ordinarily. This is not a robbery. This is not an attempted rape. I mean, this is somebody who is trying to kill and is reveling in the killing. And I've got to think that this attack is likely the result of the same person we've been talking about this whole time. And the reveling, the killing is what strikes me in this, you know, last murder, even, even though the MO seems to have changed. I mean, running your hands through the blood of the victim with the blood that you inflicted and kind of like a child, my kids can't keep their hands out of paint when they see it. And that's almost what I see. This killer breaks in, sees the pool of blood and is like, yes, I did this. Sticks their hands in the blood and is like, I, I imagine them like wiping it on their face because they get such glee and glory out of what has just happened. And in their glee, they're putting, you know, their the, the handprints all over the walls. I mean, it's, it's, maniacal what the scene is left behind but you have to imagine the person who did it as well and he knows that the woman got away she her body's not in that room and so he knows that the police are coming he doesn't care he takes time to enjoy his handiwork in a very gruesome fashion so brett this is like really one of the creepiest series of events that i've ever heard and it's amazing that this man just started attacking out of nowhere and then stopped attacking. So who was this person? Well, let's talk about some suspects. Shortly after Betty Lou was murdered, remember Betty Lou was the woman who was playing the saxophone at the nightclub. And when she was murdered, her saxophone was missing. So after she was murdered, a man showed up at a pawn store looking to sell an alto saxophone in Corpus Christi, which is a good 450 miles away. The Rangers intercepted him and found him in possession of a 45 and with clothes that were covered in blood. Sounds like a good suspect. But apparently after he was interviewed, he was cleared of this crime, at least. For what it's worth, Betty Lou's saxophone was actually eventually found in the forest near where she was dumped. But the Texas Rangers did a pretty good job because they were able to track this guy 450 miles away. Now, super suspect that he's had blood all over his clothes and he may have been involved in some other shady deals, but it wasn't Betty Lou's murder or the other four murderers in Texarkana. Yeah, I tried to follow up and figure out what in the world this guy had actually done, but I couldn't find any record of it. So if somebody out there knows, let us know. Yeah, different true crime story. Now, so that strikes him out pretty quickly. Let's talk about German prisoners of war. I know you're thinking, say what? Rumors, of course, ran rampant in Texarkana, and one was that an escaped German POW was responsible for the murders. Although it's true that there were escaped POWs around this time, it seems unlikely that one set up shop in Texarkana, which is a pretty small town, pretty safe town, and started murdering people. And his voice was heard by several of his victims. And at least in the records we've seen, no one's indicated that they had any sort of an accent that placed them outside of Texarkana. Yeah, I think this is just one of those crazy rumors that happens whenever you have murders like this. I think, once again, I think this was somebody who knew the area. And if you're a German POW who's escaped, you're trying to do something other than become a serial killer in Texarkana. So I'm going to go with this one is probably not right, despite the rumors in town. Sexy theory, but not right. And by the way... Sexy theory, but unlikely. I just realized. Remember... I've told you about like one of my deepest fears is sitting or standing next to a window when it's dark outside and I'm in a lit room. This is why there is truth to my fear. Oh my goodness. There you go. I'm never again standing next to a window. Enjoy sleeping tonight. Alice. I'm looking nervously behind me because there's a window <laughs> behind me. Jeez, Brett, you always do this to me. I'm sorry. sorry. Let's continue this story because we got to get this over with. I'm going to continue with my favorite suspect, which is also a sexy theory, unlikely, the Zodiac Killer. That's right. It's the Zodiac Killer in Texarkana. For those of you who don't know, the Zodiac Killer is a famous serial killer who operated in and around San Francisco 
in the late 60s. The timing obviously is a little, little weird there, but let me explain. So the MOs are similar. The Zodiac Killer famously would also attack people on lovers' lanes, and he would do so with a firearm, and he would use a flashlight to blind them, which is consistent with this killer's initial approach. And he would wear a hood. One of his most famous murders occurred on a lake. There was a couple who were having a picnic or whatnot on the lake, and up shows the Zodiac Killer wearing a hood. Now, he was active in the 1960s, and it's generally believed that in the 1960s, he was in his late 30s or early 40s, maybe even a little earlier. Now, if that was the case, he would have needed to have been either a late teen or early 20s during the Texarkana murders. Now, I think that is possible. Number one, that fits with the age that were given by our witnesses. The other thing, this killer, if it were the Zodiac Killer, these would have been his first murders, and this would have sort of been his, his juvenilia. This is his early entree into murder. The Zodiac Killer starts off very efficiently. He shows up and he murders people, and he's sort of got it down. He's got his M.O. down. And this guy, his initial murder is a little clumsy. In fact, it's not even a murder. He interrupts two people, and he kills neither one of them. That would have been his sort of first action. In a lot of cases, when you see these serial killers, their first few criminal acts actually don't end in murder. They sort of graduate to that. So you could see that. The other thing, this is 1946. This is right after the war. Imagine someone who's in their late teens who joined the military with plans of going over and you know fighting the Nazis and killing a bunch of people or whatever. Then the war ends. They're still in the military. Texarkana has a couple military bases around it. This could have been a person who was moving into Texarkana, or maybe they were from Texarkana and then got shipped out to California and San Francisco, which also had military bases. And as a matter of fact, after one of the Zodiac Killer's murders, he actually escaped across a military base. So you could imagine sort of these are his early killings. Whatever happens next, he's deployed or he's in prison. I mean, who knows what happens in the 50s? And then as he gets older, sort of this urge to kill again comes back and he restarts in California. That would explain why the killing started when they did. It would also explain why they ended while they did. And then you see this sort of gap. Is this likely? No, of course not. <laughs> and this is sort of an often, whenever you have unexplained murders, people like to tie famous serial killers with them. So you'll see like people will say that the BTK killer is, is Zodiac or that Jeffrey Dahmer killed Adam Walsh. I mean, you see this a lot. Is it likely? No. Is it possible? I actually think it is. I think this is more possible than a lot of people let on. One other thing I'll point to, the MOs change in both cases. In this case, he starts off killing people on lover's lanes. Then he attacks these people in their home. In the Zodiac Killer, he starts off killing people in lover's lanes. His final murder is of a taxi cab driver, which is very strange. Zodiac Killer also claimed more murders than he was accounted for. And the Zodiac Killer liked press. You could imagine that coming from this. This murder leads to this whole Phantom Killer thing and Life Magazine. You can imagine as he gets more sophisticated, he wants more press and that's why the letters start because he wants to make sure that he's getting the same kind of credit for his later murders as he got for his early murders. That's my argument for why it's a Zodiac Killer. I don't actually think it's a Zodiac Killer, but I think it is an interesting theory. I mean, at this point, it, it might as well be the Zodiac Killer. We really don't know. <laughs> so when you see these types of MOs, you do have copycats, but it, it is interesting because your MOs typically come from some deep desire or kind of obsession. And it's usually not just to be, you know, news line grabbing. Of course, those who like attention, you know, want the, want the attention for it, but your MO typically comes from something you know, from your childhood or something that you desire. Maybe this person wanted a lover, you know, had been spurned by a woman or a man on lover's lane before. And maybe that's why his attention was geared towards couples. But it, it is interesting when the MOs are similar. The Prosecutors is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Let's face it, sometimes multitasking can be overwhelming. Like when your favorite podcast is playing and the person next to you is talking and your car fan is blasting. 
all while you're trying to find that perfect parking spot. But then again, sometimes multitasking is easy, like quoting with Progressive Insurance. They do the hard work of comparing rates so you can find a great rate that works for you, even if it's not with them. Give their nifty comparison tool a try and you might just find getting the rate and coverage you deserve is easy. All you need to do is visit Progressive's website to get a quote with all the coverages you want, like comprehensive and collision coverage or personal injury protection. Then you'll see Progressive's direct rate and their tool will provide options from other companies all lined up and ready to compare. So it's simple to choose the rate and coverages you like. Press play on comparing auto rates. Quote at Progressive.com to join the over 27 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. Guys, it's such an honor to be sponsored by June's Journey. Thank you to all of you who took part in their Golden Soiree event for trying to beat my score and, and many of you who did. And I hope if you haven't given June's Journey a try, you will go ahead and do so. We are so honored that they support us and we want you to support them. June's Journey is the perfect game for a fan of true crime. It combines mystery, a whodunit, and a fun puzzle game that you can enjoy for a few minutes or if you got the time, for a few hours. I love June's Journey. It is my happy place. I love firing it up when I have a few minutes or if I just want to relax at the end of the day after a long stressful day, June's Journey is there for me. I know you guys will enjoy it. So find your inner detective. Download June's Journey today. It is available on Android and iOS mobile devices, or if you want to play on PC, find it through Facebook games. Join us and let's solve a mystery together. And now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. Guys, we know it's stressful out there. It's been stressful for a long time, and in many ways, it's only getting worse. And the fact is, even when times are good, we all have our own stressors. We all have our own problems, and sometimes we just want to talk to somebody. And that's where our sponsor, BetterHelp, comes in. In. A therapist can help you become a better problem solver, it can help you deal with the stresses in your life, can make it easier to accomplish your goals, no matter how big or small. So if you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. It's convenient, accessible, affordable, and entirely online. You don't have to go to anybody's office. And if you don't like your therapist, it is easy to change. You can get matched with a the therapist after filling out a brief survey and switch therapist at any time time. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit betterhelp.com slash prosecutors today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash prosecutors. Guys, we got a very different kind of sponsor for this episode, The Jordan Harbinger Show, which is a podcast you really should be listening to. And I know every day somebody tells you to listen to a podcast, and most of the time, you don't do it. And maybe you've been listening to us, and we've been telling you, listen to Jordan Harbinger, and you haven't done it. Well, now is the time to give it a chance. Jordan's show, which Apple named one of its best of 2018, is aimed at making you a better informed, more critical thinker so you can get a sense of how the world actually works and come to your own conclusions about what's happening even inside your own brain. And there is an episode for everyone. If you're listening to this podcast, you probably like true crime. And Jordan Harbinger has true crime. If you want to learn about Frank Abagnale, catch me if you can. Jordan's the place to go. If you want to hear about Sammy the Bull Gravano, learn a little bit about the mob. Jordan is the place to go. And if you want to hear Amanda Knox tell her own story in her own words, Jordan is the place to go. So we really enjoy this show and we think you will as well. Search for The Jordan Harbinger Show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R on Apple Podcast, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You will not regret it. Now let's talk about some more suspects because I don't know that we're any closer to knowing who did this yet. And Brett, I got to know who did this because this is so creepy. Well, I'll say this. The next two suspects, I think it's one of them. That's fair. Okay. Well, with that, listen up closely. The first one I'm going to talk about is Henry Booker, known as Duty Tennyson. Now, Tennyson was only 18 years old when he killed himself in 1948 by drinking cyanide. And in his suicide note, he left instructions which led to another note wrapped up inside a pen inside a lockbox in which he confessed to the murders. The note read, why did I take my own life? 
Well, when you committed two double murders, you would too. Yes, I did kill Betty Jo Booker and Paul Martin in the city park that night, and I killed Mr. Starks, and I tried to get Mrs. Starks. Tennyson had played trombone in the band with Betty Lou. He went on to write, I did it when mother was either out or asleep and no one saw me do it. For the guns, I disassembled them and discarded them in different places. Running away would not do any good. The police would find me. One of Tennyson's cousins became a researcher and noticed that all the young victims had attended a movie at the Paramount Movie Theater the night they were attacked. Tennyson had been an usher at the Paramount and the Starks had often visited Katie's sister who lived next door to Tennyson's best friend, James Freeman, who would later provide an alibi for Tennyson on the night of one of the slayings. Several decades later though, James would shoot himself. So this one's really interesting, not least of which because he confesses to these crimes. The things, let's go through the sort of the, the pros and cons of this. The con for this is he's so young. He's so young. He kills himself when he's 18. This would have happened the year before when he was 17. That is pretty young to commit what seem like pretty sophisticated murders. I mean, I will say this, this person was in command of the scene. You see that from the first murder where he's, he's ordering people around. He's, He's got his plan of what he's going to do. Now, 17 year olds can be just as vicious as anybody and teenagers can commit some of the most brutal, horrific crimes you can imagine. I'm not questioning that it's more the sophistication. And a lot of people point to that, that, well, could he have pulled this off? But on the other hand, these aren't that sophisticated murders. Yes, he's in command, but when you have a gun, gun can give you a lot of confidence whoever you are. This person, look, you have to figure out how is it, was it just bad luck that this person came upon these people in these lovers lanes? Was he just sort of trolling the area and he came upon them and killed them? That's possible, maybe even likely, but this takes care of that problem because what you imagine is Tennyson is essentially hunting people in his job as an usher. And so he's ushering, he's watching these movies, he's watching people come in and he selects somebody. And then when they leave, he follows them. And maybe he does this, the whole every three weeks thing. So the myth is that this person killed, you know, on the full moon or he did it every three weeks, but that's not actually true. He did tend to do it on a Saturday night, but he didn't do it like clockwork. So you can imagine that what's happening is he's selecting people at the movies, but then they go home or, you know, they, they don't set themselves up in a place where he could kill them. But when he does, when he follows them and they go to a lover's lane, he then executes his plan. Remember the first one, the first group of people, they had been there for less than 10 minutes when the murderer showed up. So if the murderer didn't follow them, to that location, then he came upon them pretty quickly. Like I said, that's possible that that's just a coincidence, but it seems more like somebody who was following them. And that's what he says he did, that he followed them. He knew Betty Jo Parker, which once again, a lot of times serial killers know their victims or have some connection to their victims. Some people say that he doesn't confess to all the murders. I don't actually know if that's true. He says, when you committed two double murders, you would too. Now he only names Betty Jo Booker and Paul Martin and then the Starks. The Starks is not a double murder. He did not kill Mrs. Starks. I think what he's saying here is he committed two double murders and he attacked the Starks. He knew Betty Jo and he knew Paul, so he named them. He might not have even known the other two. That might have just been a random thing. So he says he committed the two double murders and he points out the two people he knows and then he knows the Starks. Why does he know them? So Mrs. Stark's sister lived next door to right. Tennyson's best friend. So they, they were often in that area. So he probably saw them come and go a good bit. And you know what's really interesting to me, Brett, that jumps out to me is We've talked a lot about how the MO and the hunting and the kind of cinematic nature of these attacks and murders are not fit for the 1940s. But Tennyson was an usher at the Paramount Movie Theater. What do you do all the time when you're at the movie theater, when you're an usher? You see lots of movies where there are dramatic, you know, chases and dramatic murders and gory details. And it's exactly what what it sounds like. It's cinematic. And so he is filled with kind of this Hollywood version of 
horror and drama at all times that this type of MO kind of fits someone who's around all that drama and Hollywoodness all the time and where he would get these ideas of these chases and wearing a burlap bag over his face. That all seems straight out of the movies. That would make sense if he's watching movies all the time. And the reason the murders end in May of the year before is because he leaves and goes to college. He actually kills himself, I think, at Arkansas. I think he's at the University of Arkansas when he kills himself. So the idea is he sort of finishes up his murders, he goes off to college, but it weighs on him, and eventually he decides to drink cyanide and leave these notes. There are a couple things people point to. There's another note that says something like, ignore any other instructions I've left. Some people say that means to ignore this note. If you read the two notes, though, together, that doesn't seem to be what it's saying at all. So I feel like people who use that is, in, is to get rid of Tennyson, I don't think that works. I think this is a legitimate confession. Now, Tennyson may have had some serious issues and may have had a life that didn't seem to amount to much. And so he decided that the way he would be famous and the way he would be remembered and the way he'd still be, you know, talked about in October of 2022 is to take credit for something he didn't do. And that may seem strange, but he wouldn't be the first person to do it. So he could be lying, but it is interesting. There, the James Freeman connection, he gives this alibi for him. It's a weak alibi. And there are people who think that Freeman was actually involved in this. And that's why he's giving the alibis. He's trying to protect Tennyson to protect himself. So really interesting suspect. We will link to the, the website. There's a website that sort of talks about this. There's just a lot of really interesting stuff out there about Tennyson that you can run down. And I think he is definitely a viable suspect. He is not the favorite suspect though. The favorite suspect by most people, including people who write books on this and the police is Yule Sweeney. So Yule Sweeney was a 29 year old local thief and criminal who liked to steal cars. When police looked at some of the dates that Sweeney stole cars, they noticed that they coincided with the dates of the murders. So they decided to pick up Sweeney's wife and she had some interesting information, including details of the murders that only the killer should know. Yule owned a 32 and Peggy, his wife, couldn't account for his whereabouts on the dates of the crimes. Yule had once come home covered in blood, which Mrs. Sweeney thought was interesting. The police later recovered a blood covered towel exactly where Peggy said it would be. The police also recovered a shirt with the word Stark on the inside of the collar. And in fact, Peggy claimed she was present for the Booker Martin murder. She knew the location of the park where they were killed. She knew where Martin's date book had been found in the bushes and claimed that Sweeney had gotten rid of the 32 after the murders, which accounted for the change in weapons before the Stark murders. So these are all really good. This is all really good evidence. We're going to tell you why some of this may be a little bit weaker than it sounds at the beginning, but these are the things point people, these are the things people point to when they point to Sweeney as being responsible. So on July 15th, 1946, Sweeney was picked up once again in a stolen vehicle. When the police arrested him, his first words were, please don't shoot me. The officer told him he wouldn't shoot him, to which Sweeney replied, Mr. Don't play games with me. You want me for more than stealing cars. I will spend the rest of my life behind bars this time, which seemed very strange to the officer. So this all seemed like a slam dunk case. You get all this evidence, you have his own statements, but then Peggy changed her mind about testifying. And as we've talked about on Legal Briefs, our other podcast you all should be listening to, if Peggy doesn't want to testify, she doesn't have to testify. She can invoke her right as his spouse not to testify against him. Now, the police were very concerned about this because they could not have a situation where they did not get a conviction on these crimes. So they decided to cut a deal with Sweeney. If he would plead guilty to being a habitual offender, they'd drop any murder charges. He agreed and he actually accepted a life sentence in February of 1947. Like most life sentences, this one actually didn't stick and Sweeney was released from prison 26 years later. He would die in 1994. So there's a few things cutting against this though. The first is his fingerprints didn't match any at the crime scene. Now it's possible the fingerprints the police found weren't the fingerprints of the murderer. But remember, you did have the murderer making handprints all over the wall in somebody's blood. So you would think they would have some pretty good ones. 
I've never been able to figure out whether they tested the fingerprints of Duty Tennyson or not, but they certainly did Sweeney. The best evidence against Sweeney came from his wife, Peggy, and her confession, but there were a few problems. Number one, Peggy was known to be intellectually challenged. One officer put it bluntly that Peggy's bread wasn't baked, and the authorities needed to solve this crime. They needed to, to find someone, so it would not be surprising if her statements, confessions, and the evidence that she just happened to lead them to were maybe coerced, or if you don't want to go that far, that she was helped along in discovering the evidence and just happening to know where some of that evidence was located. And indeed, in a letter to her parents, Peggy suggested just that. And I will read you this letter to the extent it makes sense. This is from February 19th, 1947. Dear mom, dad, and kids, we'll write you again today. How are all of you? Fine, I hope. I guess the sheriff on the Texas side and that FBI man have been out to the house for they was up to see me yesterday. They still think Sweeney killed those people. I don't know what to do. They don't believe me. So what else can I do to tell them that he did it? They will believe a lie. If I send Sweeney to the chair, that would be on my mind the rest of my life for taking his life when he was not the one that killed that little boy and girl on April 13th, 1946. I could send him to the chair then. I would be killed. That so-and-so that you all rented that house from said we was in his field on April 14th, 1946. That is a lie. I wish that dad would said something to him about it too. I don't think that they want to send me to the pen, but it is Sweeney they are after. Mr. Phillip told them some lie too. I guess he thinks if they do away with Sweeney, that would help him to get out and that I would marry him. I wouldn't marry him now if I knew I would get out by marrying him. In my book, he don't rate as high as Sweeney does and Sweeney don't rate at all. Well, that's a, that's a rough thing to say about your husband. Mother, I don't know if this will pass out of here or not, but I hope so. I find out why the judge won't lower my bond. It's no use in trying to make my bond because the FBI man, you know who I'm talking about, would have to go out and look at the land and everything. He would turn it down or they'll raise the bond so high that you can't make it. I find out more than the lawyer. I think you and dad just threw away $250. So this is, this is a pretty damning letter as far as her confession goes. Obviously this would not be the first time a confession was coerced and it's, I don't know, there's good evidence against Sweeney if you believe her initial statement, but pretty much everything against Sweeney comes from her statements. Like if you take out her statements and what she told the police and apparently the evidence that she led them to, if you take that out, then all you have is Sweeney saying he's going to spend the rest of his life behind bars. And here's the thing. People are always like, why would he say that? He just stole a car. No, he knew that he was going to be a habitual offender if he was arrested again. Trust me, every person, every criminal knows if their next arrest is going to be the thing that puts them away for the rest of their life. They all know that. He knew that. So the fact that he was arrested with a stolen car, he knew it was going to be a habitual offender and that was life in prison. And in fact, he ended up pleading guilty to that to avoid the death penalty for these murders. So that doesn't hold as much weight with me. So it really just comes down to, do you believe Mrs. Sweeney when she makes her initial statement about him being involved? Or do you believe her letter to her parents where she says, essentially, I was coerced into doing this. They won't believe the truth. They only believe a lie. And it's the only way I can get out of jail is if I tell them that Sweeney did it. And here's the thing. I mean, the first, you know, when we first start, started talking about Sweeney and whether he's the actual perpetrator, everything that points to him really is Peggy. And if the police themselves recognize that Peggy's not very bright, there were a lot more questionable interrogation tactics back then, and they can easily, you know, suggest things to her that she may just be tired or exhausted or think, you know, nobody even listens to me. It doesn't matter. I'll just say yes. But one thing that jumped out to me about her quote unquote confession was the fact she said she was present for the Booker Martin murders. That's not part of the MO, right? We know from at least two, seemingly two of the attacks where there were survivors that it seems to be one person doing the attacking. So that's that would be surprising to me because she would have known that he was chasing her for two miles, which is not a short amount of time. That's going to be 45 minutes or so of following after him while he chases this woman that he's then going to rape. And whatever she thinks about her husband, 
it's one thing maybe to catch him killing someone, like by accident she walks in and he shot somebody. It's a whole other thing to follow her husband dutifully as he chases a young woman for two miles and then rapes her and then shoots her and then takes the time to position her to button up her coat and position you know, Betty Jo's hand in the pocket before saying, okay, Peggy, time to go home. That just seems very unlikely. And why would she say she was there for that particular murder? That murder in particular, we know there was distance between the two victims. And so there was time. That was not, that was not a short murder at all. That took some time. And it doesn't indicate that she showed up, what, to pick him up or something. If she was there for the killings, she said, she was there for all of it, for hours. And she doesn't give very much detail about those particular instances either. You would think something like a double homicide with one of them, you know, leading to a two-mile chase would spark something in her. Like, yeah, I was really tired that night. I wore, sh you know, holes in my shoes from walking for two miles on a country road in the forest. And so I, I don't know. I mean, it, it seems like a really good suspect until you take out everything Peggy says. And because of this letter and because of what we know about her maybe mental capacity. I'm not sure we can really trust anything she said initially about Yule's involvement. And I'll say this, I think the witness as passive observer thing is something that you see in so many false confessions because it's just, it, it's like you're there and you're watching it happen and you're telling the police and you're giving them everything they want, but you weren't involved, you didn't do anything. I think it's, I think it is probably, you've put your finger on it, of all the things about her confession about her husband, that is the thing that rings the most false. It'd be one thing if, you know, she's home and he comes home and he has a bloody shirt. You totally see that. You know, he used to have a 32 and then one day he comes home and didn't have it anymore. Or maybe he confesses to her. Or maybe she finds the shirt with the name on it in his possessions. I mean, these are all things that make sense. She was not at the murder. Even if he did it, she wasn't there. That was a lie. Even if he did it, that was something the police fed her or was something she made up to make the, the lie more believable. There's no way she was there for all the reasons you said. I'm not going to rehash them because you nailed it. There's no way she was there. And you mentioned sort of the brutal tactics of, of the past. Another example of that is Sweeney actually offers to take sodium pentothal, which is often you know called a truth serum, to prove that he's innocent and the police actually gave it to him. <laughs> they took him up on his offer, but unfortunately it knocked him out. He took it and he just passed out. So it didn't work and he wasn't able to alleviate their concerns. Obviously he never admitted to these crimes. He denied it until his dying day. And you might say, well, why'd he plead guilty to the other thing? Because he, he knew that they had him dead to rights. He didn't want to go to the chair. It was simple as that. And so he confessed this other thing. And then he spent, you know, the next 20 years fighting that conviction. And eventually he got out. So he played the game right. If he hadn't done that, he probably would have ended up being executed for these crimes. Because I think he would have been convicted based on the evidence they had, even if they couldn't get her to testify. I think the, the evidence that she had sort of generated for them, they probably would have been successful with. And honestly, if they'd kept pressure on her, she probably would have testified in the end anyway. But... It's, it's look, it's an interesting person. I actually don't think it's Sweeney. I think it's Tennyson. Tennyson is my guy. I think Tennyson did this. I buy his confession. Everything about, you could see Sweeney graduating from petty criminal to murder, but that doesn't happen that often. Yes, as we said, the crimes often start smaller than murder, but not car theft. That's not what we're talking about. Assault, like you see in the first crime. The first crime is the sort of crime you see for a new serial killer who's graduating. Somebody who, they hit somebody on the head, they sexually assault someone with a pistol, they get interrupted and they run away. I mean, that is, a, that is just a prototypical first crime. And that to me is much more the initial criminal activity graduating to the murder and then getting more comfortable with the murders and more brazen with the murders. There's no reason to think that Yul Sweeney at 29 years old, all of a sudden decided that petty criminal and car thief wasn't good enough anymore. Now he's going to commit these brazen murders, including the final one against the Starks. So I don't think it's Sweeney. I think it was Tennyson. Tennyson's my guy. If I had to, if I had to bet on this, I would say it's him. 
Yeah, I won't add too much there. I agree with you, Brett, and mostly because I think Peggy is just a red herring, and all of the things that point to Sweeney are, it just, it's, I don't think it's true. Whereas Tennyson, I think there's a lot, when you can trace all of these victims back to the Paramount Theater where he worked, I mean, you begin to see the spider web. This is like literally the, the thought boards that you see in movies where detectives put up who they think are the suspects, and all the lines lead back to the Paramount Theater, and also the cinematic nature of these attacks and murders and rapes, I think have this Hollywood quality to them that a very young, impressionable teenager would maybe have seeped too much in and internalized to be able to carry this out. And the details in his note, I think are very, very interesting by naming two of his victims and where, where they died. I know these were very publicized murders, but I, I do think that he points to, there's so many links to him and how he would know these people that it's very curious. And I think he's the best suspect that we have. And look, we, we know of one rape in this case, right? And that was Betty Jo Booker. So the first, in the first crime, the woman was sexually assaulted with a firearm. Maybe he would have raped her. We don't know, but he was, she was sexually assaulted with a firearm. There's no sign of rape for the second victim, but then Betty Jo Booker is raped. And who is it that he knows in this case? He knows Betty Jo Booker. He played in the band with her. You could imagine very easily him being obsessed with her and he sees this opportunity to add her to his list of victims and, and he also rapes her beforehand. And he also knew Mrs. Stark. Maybe he intended to do the same thing if he'd have gotten into that house that day to her before he killed her. We don't know, but the fact of that connection to me adds a lot of weight to that. Now, if you want to know more about the Sweeney case, a book was recently written called The Phantom Killer, Unlocking the Mystery of the Texarkana Serial Murders, The Story of a Town in Terror, which is a really long name by James Presley. Presley is either the son or the grandson of the sheriff from Texarkana at the time. So he had access to a lot of information, a lot of documents. And he argues that his dad or his granddad or whatever got it right when they thought it was Sweeney. So he lays that case out pretty convincingly if you want to read that. And then, like I said, we'll put up a few other things, including did duty do it? which is it's put together by one of his cousins who who thinks that he is responsible for the crime. So you can check that out as well. And let us know what you think. And if you just can't get enough of the town that dreaded sundown today, what had been a tragedy has become a tourist attraction. And every year on Halloween, so at the end of this month, the town sponsors a showing of the film, The Town That Dreaded Sundown. And the legend of what happened in Texarkana has displaced the bloody, brutal reality. That's so dark. <laughs> I don't know that I'll ever be able to watch that, but I'm glad you are, Brett. And there's a whole discussion about that, right? I mean, that's a whole sort of interesting side thing of, you know, because when you're in true crime and you talk about these cases, there's always somebody who's, who's criticizing true crime in general. And when does it become appropriate to do things like have a film festival in the town where five people were murdered and eight people were attacked and when they do it. And when the movie initially came out, Texarkana hated the movie, which you can imagine. They did not like the movie. They didn't like the fact anybody was looking into this, but now they've sort of embraced it. So if you're around Texarkana, I hear it's a really interesting town either way. And if you're there on Halloween, you can watch the movie, but if you're not and you want to watch the movie tonight, then do so and join me and I will be watching it and we can explore it together. We're interested to hear what you guys think about this case or about the movie, the town that dreaded sundown. There is a sequel that was made a couple years ago or not a sequel, a remake. We'll not be watching that one. We're going to watch the original. Well, let us know what you think at prosecutors pod for all your social media prosecutors pod at gmail.com. If you want to shoot us an email, hello on YouTube. Hello to all our fans on Patreon, thank you guys so much for supporting us, for telling your friends, and for leaving five-star reviews. Well, Alice, is there anything else you want to add before we close up this first episode of October? Y'all, 
Humor Brett. He loves October. So drop in on Twitter and watch this movie with him tonight. And also come back next time for another creepy, creepy story that is going to make me probably not be able to sleep again. It's the best part is making Alice where she can't sleep. And we will be back next week with another horrific, terrifying tale of true crime in October. But until then, I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the prosecutors. What you should do, you should you that? should voice trailers. Trailers are an art form in and of themselves. Like I could sit down and just watch trailers. I don't need to watch the whole movie. Oh, I love like, movie trailers. A good trailer is like mm, artwork. They don't really do the the voiceover thing anymore. That used to be the big thing. They used to be the big. This is true. in a town that dreaded sundown. <laughs> one man hunts for a serial killer. <laughs> See, there you go. Who will survive, and who is the murderer? <laughs> <laughs>to watch so you think you can dance is that, well, that show on? was awesome i don't yeah, think it it's still going on why that i'm confused about because that was like actual good dancing you should have tried out <laughs> a lot of my friends did it's gone now so unless you restart it unless i also rewind a few decades <laughs> <laughs>